Hi, thanks for joining this session. I'm Mark Roper, Senior Product Manager for Amazon DynamoDB, and I'm thrilled to announce this session's speaker, Atilio Jue, Director of Content Discovery for Disney+. I had the privilege of working with Atilio as Disney built, scaled, and globally launched Disney+. And I've got to tell you, this was no small feat, as Atilio will describe in today's session, but one that has been very successful both technologically and commercially. And on a personal note, I want to extend my thanks to Atilio and the Disney Plus team for launching a critical service for my own family's mental well-being over the past several months. Atilio, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, this is the first time I've worn a college shirt in eight months, so I'm very excited to be here and also glad we can help with a little bit of distracting entertainment. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I've been working for Disney for a few years now after they acquired uh, the company called Bamtech, Bamtech Media, uh, which was spun out of uh, Major League Baseball Advanced Media. Uh, all told, I've been working in various forms of this company for about 12 years. Uh, in the beginning with baseball statistics and ticketing systems, later when the company branched out uh, into providing streaming products, for third party businesses. Uh, I worked on things like WWE Network, HBO Now, Fox Sports Go, among other things. And now as part of Disney, one of the things I'm working on is Disney Plus, uh, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, so enough about me. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about <clears throat> what Disney Plus is, uh, what content discovery does for it. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about some of our use cases for DynamoDB. Uh, and then I'm gonna wrap it up with some basic uh, learnings and other tech takeaways uh, that we found from launching and operating Disney Plus for a year now. Um, this is just the obligatory introductory, introductory slide. Um, and then let's go right into what is Disney Plus. Uh, so it's a video streaming service uh, that hosts a lot of Disney's most popular brands, uh, which you can see here behind this uh, giant Disney Plus logo. You have Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, uh, National Geographic, uh, in addition to uh, just Disney branded content, right? So I'm sure most people have heard of at least uh, one of those things besides Disney. Um, and you see in this image also it depicts the top of the home page of the application. Um, while that looks pretty straightforward, uh, there's actually a lot of services both in the foreground and the background uh, that support rendering this home page. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit of, about a few of those today. Uh, content discovery team is uh, teams are the ones that I manage. Uh, they're responsible for APIs that serve the content metadata for the Disney Plus application. So that's basically the metadata around the videos themselves, right? Uh, so everything that you see in this uh, sample of images uh, is powered by one of our APIs, including uh, the home page and other brand landing pages. So you click on Marvel and you see essentially a home page for Marvel. Uh, recommendations and trending content on the home page. We're going to talk a little more about recommendations later. Uh, continue or resume watching functionality on the home page, uh, series and movie detail pages. Um, we'll talk about that later in relation to bookmarks, which I'll explain about. Um, the explore page is powered by our site search service. So that's uh, you go in and you search for Frozen. Uh, you'll, you'll see stuff that's related to Frozen. Uh, watch list pages, right? So that's where you can add items that you are interested in watching, maybe not now, so you'll, you'll add them to your watch list, you'll go into that page, you can watch from there. I'll talk about watch list a little more. Uh, and all the images themselves are served out of our image APIs. Uh, so those, as you can see, like all of these services combined together, a pretty essential set for the Disney Plus experience. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our scale. Um, so November 12th, 2019 was the day that we launched um, Disney Plus in the US and Canada. We had been running a, a technical test in the Netherlands for a few months up until that point. Uh, the traffic on launch day was much higher than anticipated, to say the least, uh, with over 3 billion requests to our content APIs. Um, part of the reasoning for that, you can see the uh, character there in the upper uh, right corner is uh, known as the child. Uh, this is a pretty popular character in a Disney Plus original series called The Mandalorian, which is part of Star Wars brand. Um, probably mentioned The Mandalorian a few times more. Uh, since launch, uh, we've expanded to over 30 countries with 
more coming soon, uh, 30 countries and territories, uh, and are delivering tens of terabytes of content metadata a day, hundreds of terabytes of images a day, hundreds of millions of recommendations a day are delivered by our machine learning team uh, over Kinesis and inserted into DynamoDB, and uh, billions of bookmarks ingested a day over Kinesis and into DynamoDB. And we'll talk a little bit about bookmarks and what those are in a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's go on to the next one here. Um, just a final note about what, what our stacks look like. We're in many regions uh, and with pretty much identical stacks uh, in Europe and North America, where most of our customers are today. Um, we use this multi-region setup for um, all the obvious reasons, uh, failover, right? regional issues could cause us to decide to just remove a region uh, from our Route 53 and just divert all the traffic to a different region. Um, and also reducing latencies, so Route 53 behind CloudFront uh, is routing traffic to the closest origin, right? So there's uh, that aspect of it. Uh, but ultimately what we're trying to do is make that guest experience um, of using Disney Plus uh, as magical as possible, right? It's magical is one of the words we use a lot of in uh, at Disney. Uh, so moving on. Uh, we're going to cover the DynamoDB use cases first uh, and then go into some learnings afterwards and some tips. So one of our first use cases is pretty basic. Uh, it's called Watch List, basic concept for a streaming service. You're looking around the catalog, you're browsing around the catalog, you see something that you want to watch. Uh, in our case, you click on a plus sign, it gets added to your watch list. Uh, you then, like I mentioned before, you go to the watch list screen, you see your latest watch list items. Uh, you can start watching them from there. When you're done, if you remember, you can remove them from your watch list. And our architecture for watch list um, uh, is backed by a, a global table. It's also equally simple, uh, which you know, I highly recommend. Simplicity definitely helps when you're reasoning about systems and debugging them. Uh, but you can see here, we have a service that's in front of a global DynamoDB table, uh, which lets you query thing, uh, do query against it, do things like uh, check if a particular series or video is on a watch list, get the latest set of watch list items, um, obviously add and remove stuff from your watch list. There's really nothing too uh, complex here or too special going on here, other than the the table itself uh, helps us, you know, keep uh, those watch list entries in sync across all the regions which we're deployed in with very low latency, right? So if we had to, whatever, for whatever reason, fail over to a different region, no concerns there about a stale watch list. Uh, one of our next use cases is called is around bookmarks. I mentioned it before. Um, basic concept for a video streaming service. You start watching a video, you pause it, you pick it up later where you left off, um, or you start watching it on your phone, and you want to continue watching it on your TV if you know you still happen to own a TV. Um, you're watching a series and you want to continue watching it with the next episode of the series when that's available. Um, these are all your basic uh, user stories and they're handled or with uh, the use of bookmarks, right? Which keep track of where you are in a stream for a particular piece of content. Uh, why it's called the bookmark, I have no idea. These are clearly not books, but that's how we refer to them. I guess video marks would sound kind of weird. Here we have the uh, bookmarks architecture, right? So as you're watching a video, the app itself is sending a stream of bookmark, bookmark data to a service, a telemetry service in the nearest AWS region to the video player. All right, that service uh, takes that bookmark data, writes it to a Kinesis stream, and then we read that data from the Kinesis stream and insert it into a global DynamoDB table that exists in the regions where our content app API is deployed to. Right, so uh, clients then request that bookmark data from one of our content API services uh, when they load up a home page or a series or a movie page. And uh, having the architecture broken out like this allows us to decouple where we're reading the bookmarks from uh, to where we're actually you know, serving the clients with the bookmark data. So we could deploy to any number of regions and just by adding you know, that region to the global DynamoDB table and the telemetry team can deploy to whatever regions they think are best for them. All right, so that actually opens up a lot of flexibility for us. 
Recommendations is another seemingly basic concept uh, that we offer on Disney Plus uh, that utilizes global tables, right? So you can see some examples here. Uh, recommended for you on the home page uh, is based on stuff uh, that you've watched before or other signals. Um, we recommend you watch this other content, right? Uh, because you watched a particular piece of content, here are some other things you might like is also another use case there. Um, so our architecture for that is a little more complex, but still fairly straightforward. We have a machine learning team. Uh, they generate recommendations and write them to a Kinesis stream in a single region. Uh, we read those recommendations from Kinesis. Uh, we do some work on them. Uh, and then we place them into a DynamoDB global table. Uh, from there, again, we serve them up um, from our application in whatever region the user is in. Uh, so this allows the machine learning team to not have to worry about delivering recommendations to what they believe is the AWS region that the client will be closest to. They can just focus on creating the best recommendations that they can and delivering them to us, and then we'll figure out how to deliver them to the client. Uh, we don't have to read the recommendation stream in every region and write to like a local DynamoDB table. Um, so that reduces a lot of overhead from us. We just read and write it once and let DynamoDB do the replication. And that really simplifies everything for us. And the final use case is pretty non-standard. It's around content caching. Um, but we felt like we should share this use case uh, with everyone because it did help us around launch. Um, so DynamoDB is not the source of truth for our content catalog. Uh, for that, we use a different uh, document data store. Uh, but we do use DynamoDB to cache the results of queries that we run against the document data store, and we cache it with a TTL. Uh, so the basic pattern there is uh, somebody will query for some piece of content or some uh, set of content. Uh, we'll check this DynamoDB cache. If it's missing or it's expired uh, based on the TTL, we'll pull it from the primary data store and we'll put it in the cache, serve it out from there. Uh, this helps us buffer requests to our primary data store as any sort of cache would. Uh, but you know, we considered using a standard in-memory cache service, um, you know, which would be typical uh, before the US launch. But uh, we ultimately chose DynamoDB because of a couple of reasons, but mainly around there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of the number of subscriptions and traffic estimates uh, that we were going to get on day one. So it made it very difficult for us to analyze the like, instance sizing that we would want to do with an in-memory cache. Uh, but with DynamoDB and its sort of extremely low operational and administrative overhead, we were able to set it to an on-demand mode with some pre-partitioning, which I can talk about in a little bit. Uh, that helped us uh, quite a bit in taking uh, the pressure off the main data store uh, and to scale to the levels that we needed to on day one of uh, our launch in the US and Canada. All right, so now I'm gonna, those are the basic use cases and I'll talk a little bit about the takeaways uh, that we've, we've had since launch. Uh, so some of the ways that DynamoDB has benefited us, uh, global tables specifically, um, when we, eva we, we evacuate regions, I mentioned before, like for, for certain things like uh, failover, right? There's issues and we need to, you know, move to a different region to maintain, you know, the reliability and, and the, the performance of our service. Or we may be doing some planned maintenance that requires downtime, so we may uh, shift resources to a different region. Uh, or we simply just want to test out uh, being able to remove a region and make sure that everything continues to operate without degradation. Uh, so the replication that Dynamo offers us uh, with latencies that are in very you know low digit seconds allows us to do that sort of traffic shifting without really worrying about data inconsistencies or anything like that, or even scaling concerns. Uh, in, in addition, as Disney Plus continues to grow and we launch in new countries, right, being able to leverage an additional AWS region just by adding it to the DynamoDB global table right, gives us an enormous amount of flexibility uh, in terms of being able to just stand up our stack in that region. The table's there, the data's there. We're able to just function uh, pretty simply then. Uh, scaling benefits. Um, we, we continue to grow our user base. Um, and the number of recommendations and bookmarks continue to grow, right? So DynamoDB grows along with that user base uh, with very little operational overhead on our part. 
Uh, I think that's a big theme, the operational overhead, the, the burden of managing uh, Dynamo is very low, uh, which is excellent for us. Uh, and then finally, having the ability to switch back and forth between this on-demand mode or a provision mode really helps us when we launch in a new set of countries where we don't necessarily know what the volume of requests, what the traffic's going to be like on day one. So having that ability to do that very easily is, is pretty awesome for us. Uh, the next two things are you know, basically in more in the line of tips, right? So uh, one of them is around pre-partitioning. I mentioned that before. Um, so DynamoDB partitions data um, as data storage grows, as uh, throughput grows. Uh, the number of partitions grow as well in order to maintain a high level of throughput. So on the November launch, uh, we expected a pretty large influx of uh, bookmark data, uh, which basically into like an, a, an empty table, uh, which if it wasn't partitioned to meet the demands of that scale, uh, we would have experienced throttles. So in order to meet that anticipated demand of read and write throughput without throttles, we decided to pre-partition our tables prior to launch. So the way we did that is we set a very high provisioned throughput write value uh, and let DynamoDB do its partitioning based on that. And then we switch back to an on-demand mode prior to launch in order to scale higher if we needed it. And uh, using a combination of those two things, we were able to avoid any sort of throttles on, on those tables that we did that to. And then finally, there's a, a tip here around uh, concentrated uh, read traffic supporting that, right? So an item lives in a partition, which has its own uh, limits on reading and writing. Uh, in our content cache, which I mentioned earlier, some content's more popular than others. Uh, and can result in disproportionate lookups to a partition, uh, which then results in throttling, right? So to solve that, we employed a strategy of appending a sequence number to the end of the key and writing that data to more than one entry, right? So on a request for a piece of content, we would use a GUID that was on the request and we would hash that to one of those sequence numbers and then we would look up that key. So as an example here around uh, content ID ABC123, we would map it to dot one or dot two or dot n of that and distribute the read traffic uh, amongst those entries. Uh, keep in mind, you can still use a, sac a secondary caching layer in front of this to reduce the cost and further reduce the latency. But as is the case with caches, sometimes they're unavailable or sometimes they start out cold. Uh, we're, we're pretty confident. We know that Dynamo will be able to support the full brunt of the throughput uh, that we require of these tables if those cases occur. So hopefully you were able to get a couple of tips or best practices from this presentation that'll help you with your own uh, AWS DynamoDB needs. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, certainly if uh, you found any of that uh, interesting to you, or you want to learn more about uh, the opportunities that are available with Disney, visit DisneyTech.com. And uh, if you found, uh, if you're interested in learning more about DynamoDB, uh, here are some other sessions led by some great subject matter experts, two on data modeling and two on advanced design platform uh, patterns. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening.